30 years ago, Linus Torvalds, the man behind Linux, was in university. He was studying computer science at the University of Helsinki. And one day he had an idea. This idea wasn't going to be anything that crazy. It was just going to be for a hobby project. What he wanted to do was make an operating system inspired by Minix, but didn't actually have any Minix code, basically making another Unix-like operating system. And when he decided to do this, he sent out this email saying, hello everybody out there using Minix, I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be big and professional like GNU, for 386, 486 AT clones. This has been brewing since April, and he's starting to get ready. I'd like any feedback on things people like slash dislike in Minix, as my OS resembles it somewhat, same physical layout of the file system due to practical reasons, among other things. I've currently ported Bash 1.08 and GCC 1.40, and things seem to work. This implies that I'll get something practical within a few months, and I'd like to know what features most people would want. Any suggestions are welcome, but I won't promise I'll implement them. P.S. Yes, it is free of any Minix code, and it has a multi-threaded FS. It is not prodable, because I guess being in university, you can't spell. I, I know the feeling. Uses 3D6 task switching, etc. And it probably never will support anything other than 80 hard disks, as that's all I have. And over the past 30 years, nothing really came to this operating system. It sort of just sat around being this obscure project known as Linux. Now, the date that... Linux actually started is sort of up for debate. So one of the dates is when this email was sent, which for Linus's time zone at the time would have been August 25th, 1991. The other date, though, is when the first version of the Linux kernel was actually released, and that was September 17th, 1991. Both of these dates can be considered birth dates, but I'm going to go with this one. And as of the 25th of August, Linux is now 30 years old. As that is the case, how about we start off by talking about what Linux was initially made to run on? Because while I can say 3D6, 4D6, AT clones, most people probably don't have a good understanding about what that means in terms of performance. So the Intel 3D6 and Intel 4D6, for their times, were really, really good CPUs. Now, we're talking in terms of the early 90s, but... Even so, really good CPUs for that period, and because they were such good CPUs, a lot of other companies like AMD for one started to clone the CPU, and that's how we started seeing these 3D6, 4D6 clones. So with the i3D6, you are likely to see a whopping CPU clock speed of 25 to 40 megahertz. I know, sounds absolutely crazy. And then when we go up to the i4E6, 40 to 100 megahertz. Mind blown. 100 megahertz? That's so quick. Imagine having a CPU that fast. Now, because they were both 32-bit CPUs, by absolute sheer technicality, even though no hardware like this existed at the time, you could theoretically have 4 gigabytes of RAM, but you were more likely to have 1 to 16 megabytes. And then for storage, you'd have something in the range of 60 to 200 megabytes. And considering how big the Linux kernel is nowadays, you wouldn't exactly be able to get very far just using that. Now, if you weren't using something like Minix, you were probably using an operating system like DOS or maybe OS2. And then the price of the computer can obviously vary a lot, but adjusted for inflation in USD, it would probably be in the range of $4,000. Now, while it's certainly fun to go and look back at the past, it's not like you can take a modern version of the Linux kernel and go and run it on a 3D6 system. You could back in 2012. So back in 2012, that was when 3D6 support was finally dropped. 21 years after Linux came out, long after anybody was actually running a 3D6 system, it still had support. And when that support was dropped, Linus didn't really have anything super sentimental or super nice to say. All he said on the matter was, I'm not sentimental, good riddance. And then went on to say, maybe we should even consider taking this one step further and remove the dear old FPU emulation floating point unit emulation support too. Or do people still use the 486FX? But maybe you do have an interest in these early days Linux. Maybe not running on a 486FX, 
but maybe you want to see some early documentation or see what the early source code actually looked like. Now, there are plenty of resources out there that can help you do this. One of them obviously being the repo for Linux. Now, there is archives going all the way back to version 2.6.13 RC3, and I'm sure if you went and dug through the repo itself and went backwards in the commits, you could probably get much, much earlier as well. I don't think Linux ever changed repos, but if it did, someone please let me know. What the repo doesn't have archived though is a lot of the other stuff alongside the source code that you might want to see as well. And that's where a site like oldlinux.org gets really, really cool. So if we go into the Linux ancient resources, we can see this takes us back all the way to Linux-0.01. And if we go and click on this, we can actually see in here, I believe under docs. Yeah, so we have a Linux PDF. This is the original PDF that Linus Torvalds wrote about what Linux actually is. So, Linux is a free Unix-like kernel for 386 AT computers coming with full source code. Wow, that's crazy. So if you want to go and read through this, I highly recommend it. It is very interesting to understand what Linus was actually intending initially with Linux. And if you actually want to go and install something this old, how you would actually go and do so. But there's so much other cool stuff in here as well. Things like binaries for very early applications, very early versions of libraries, archives of emails, and even things like super early versions of the kernel. Now, a lot of the information is very spotty because a lot of the stuff from back then wasn't backed up properly and sort of has disappeared into the ether. This is why archiving stuff like this is incredibly useful. Another site you might want to check out is this one here. This has a list of very early Linux distro ISOs and categorize them by year. So if you want to go and find out, hey, what is Slackware 3.1 like? What is Debian 2.0 like? You can go and download these here and go and sort of move up through history and see how it's actually changed. And I cannot forget about archive.org. They have a massive archive of really early distros, along with tons of other stuff as well. But if you want to check out some early distros, this is one of the best places to come. There are so many others, though, that I cannot list them all out, but I'll leave a link to a lot of these in the description down below. A lot of distros out there actually keep fairly decent archives, so if you want to go and download, I don't know, an ancient version of Debian or an ancient version of Ubuntu, you're probably already able to actually go and do so. And all of that laid the groundwork for the operating system we have today. You can do basically anything you want to do on a computer on a Linux system. If you want to have a very easy distribution, maybe you use something like Ubuntu, Pop! OS, Mint. If you want something that gives you a bit more freedom, maybe you use something like Arch, Void, or Gentoo. If you want something absolutely insane, but it still documents everything you need to build yourself your own distro, how about trying out Linux from scratch? And there are so many other use cases out there for Linux that it's impossible to list them. So many choices, in fact, that a common complaint about Linux is the number of choices is kind of paralyzing. Do I want to use this distro or this distro or this distro or any of the hundreds of others? It's hard for some people to work out what they actually want to use. But once you find a distro you want, or once you realize the distros don't really matter, then you can start experiencing what Linux is really like for a home user. While Linux doesn't fit a lot of industries out there because of specific software, whether that is the Microsoft Office suite, whether that's Photoshop, whether that's Premiere, or whether it's the 20-year-old DOS program that no one wants to change out because it keeps working and no one knows how it works. For home users, there's no reason why you can't go and use it. Even if you don't want to go and install it yourself, you can buy a system from someone like System76, Pine64, Purism, or if you want to go with a more well-known brand, maybe you want to go with, say, Dell and get the Developer Edition XPS, or maybe you want to go with Lenovo and get whatever they call the Linux ThinkPads. And if you've seen my live streams, you know that gaming can be a little bit janky on Linux. If you do a bit of research and you're willing to go and make some modifications to make sure the game's going to play nicely under Proton, gaming under Linux actually works quite well. Most of the things I want to play 
work perfectly fine. And even Microsoft has accepted that for some tasks, Linux is just frankly better. And now they offer WSO, Windows Subsystem for Linux, where you can run an emulated Linux environment directly under Windows without really having to do much user configuration. As for the future, the far off future is always a mystery until it's actually here, but when it comes to the short term, there's a couple of things I am really excited for. One of those being the Steam Deck. I don't know how well it's actually going to perform, but I'm getting really excited for this new device class that is forming with these handheld gaming PCs, and while Proton still needs a lot of work, the Steam Deck has this opportunity where it can take Proton from being working for most games to being almost perfect, which I think would cement Linux as actually being viable for gaming and for cheap systems, you might actually see people trying out Linux just to save a few extra bucks. I'm also really interested in seeing what happens with Linux on the M1 Max. Now, I know I don't own the M1 Mac, and a lot of you guys probably don't either, but it's running. Linux is running on the M1 Max. The drivers aren't there. It's a mess right now. Everything's running on the CPU, but it functions, and that is way better than we were a couple of months ago. I've also got my eye on a couple of hardware providers who have some really interesting devices that are running Linux. Things like Linux tablets that aren't just like, here is a cheapo tablet, something that is actually a proper two-in-one. And for better or worse, it's becoming easier to use Linux as a lot of companies start providing web applications alongside their desktop variant. So rather than having to write a native version for Linux, you could just run it inside your browser. I have my complaints about this being the direction of development, but it does allow a lot of people who weren't able to use Linux before to actually feasibly do so. I've only been using Linux for a couple of years. You can even see when I started back in the early days of my channel, and over this time, I have learned a lot about how my system works, a lot about the community, a lot about things I don't exactly like that I want to see change. And into the future, I hope I learn a lot more about all of this as well. I am excited to see what the future has in store. I don't know what it's going to be, but hey, in another 10 years, maybe I'll make another video like this. And I think that's going to be it for me. So if you like this video and you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, please go check out my Patreon subscribe star Liberapay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea where I rant about whatever's happening like the 30th anniversary of Linux. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robson Plays where I live stream twice a week, upload about five or so YouTube shorts. And this channel is also available over on Odyssey. That's going to be it for me and I'm out.